Good morning. We'll begin with a word of prayer, uh, and then we'll get into the last portion of First John. Uh, so, uh, Jeffina, if you could pray for us, please. For this day, we thank you for uh, the class that we are about to have. God, I just pray that uh, whatever we learn today, we will apply it in our life and we will live for your glory. I pray for all my classmates who are about to come, uh, help them to come soon and listen to the classes. And God, I pray for uh, a good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session. Let nothing be a distraction for us, Jesus. But God, may you reign forever. May your name be glorified. May your name be lifted high uh, through everything that we learn. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, last week, we looked at two chapters, the first two chapters of the first epistle of John. Uh, we saw that the focus in this epistle is more on uh, John warning the church uh, of the false doctrines that are creeping in and assuring them that they are uh, truly the children of God in spite of all the false allegations which the uh, uh, fake teachers were you know, making against them. So uh, today we will look at the remaining three chapters of this epistle. Um, if we can uh, begin with someone reading out for us the first uh, three verses. Yeah. If someone could please read out for us. First John chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. I'll read. First John chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, if we could have any of one of the other students who are not here in the campus read out for us. Uh, it, you know, this is a classroom setting. You know, in a classroom setting, we are supposed to have our Bibles with us and we are supposed to participate in the class. So please, uh, you know, if you could, uh, if any one of you who is online so that we will not have the echo uh, if Jeffina reads out, there's a lot of echo over here. Uh, so if, if please, you know, if you could just oblige and read out, because this is a classroom setting. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we'll look at the first three verses. Now, um, John has been talking to the believers, uh, the early church, about how even though the false teachers are saying that uh, these believers are not really God's chosen ones simply because they have not received some mysterious uh, Gnostic uh, knowledge. Um, John assures them that they are children of God. And so he, therefore, he that's how uh, he begins his chapter 3, where he says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. So the uh, secessionists, the ones who have seceded from the church, the ones who have left the church, they may be saying that you people are not chosen ones, but think about the great love the Father has lavished on us. He calls us, you know, the children of God, and what He calls us is important. So He repeats that and He says, That is what we are. You know, in case they have not caught it, He says, That is what we are. We are children of God. And then He says, The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. So these false uh, teachers and these followers of the false doctrines, the reason that they are uh, you know, saying these things about us is because they don't really know him. 
if they had known him then they would be part of the family if you remember in the previous chapter he talked about how they left the church and he says the reason that they are no longer with us is because they never really belonged with us they never really chose to become part of the family of god so it's because of that you know that they are making all these allegations against the true church of god and he assures these believers that they don't have to take these things seriously the main problem was that uh, these believers uh, the true believers in the church were kind of um, feeling a little insecure because these people who claimed gnostic knowledge were speaking in such a um, uh, you know in a in, in such a fluent manner uh they were knowledgeable people who uh, were wise in the eyes of the world so the words they used the teachings they taught all sounded so high fi it all sounded so uh, you know refined and superior and so these believers who are just talking about the cross of christ did not look very um, philosophical or great in the eyes of the world and so they began to wonder is there something wrong with us and our teaching are we too basic in what we are saying maybe these people who have received uh, uh, special secret knowledge maybe they are the ones who really have received something special from the holy spirit so these kind of doubts were creeping into the minds of the believers so john is assuring them and saying uh, you know those people actually belong to the world and the world does not know the father and that's the reason that they do not know us uh, and so then he goes on to say dear friends now we are children of god and what we will be has not yet been made known but we know this uh, that when christ appears we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is there are two main things that he is saying over here so right now we are children of god and we know what we are going to be to some extent in the future but there are other things which have not yet been revealed so he's not only assuring them of their current status he's also assuring them of the greater things which are awaiting them in the future uh, one uh, we will be like christ when we get to see him um in this context if we could please have someone read out for us second corinthians chapter 3 verses 16 to 18 which kind of throws a little bit of light on what john is saying over here so if someone could read out for us second corinthians chapter 3 uh, verses 16 to 18 second corinthians 3 16 to 18 and if the rest of us could you know turn in our bibles to second corinthians 3 um yeah if someone could read out please nevertheless when one turns to the lord the veil is taken away now the lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty but we all with unveiled face beholding us in a mirror the glory of the lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the spirit of the lord exactly so here um, paul is talking about believers and he says you know once upon a time we were not connected to the lord but now that we are connected to the lord the spirit ministers to us and the spirit brings freedom into our lives we start seeing things that we could not see earlier we start understanding god in a way that we did not know him earlier so even as we start contemplating the glory of the lord because the holy spirit is now revealing to us who he is we start catching new things about uh, you know ab about him even as we uh, study the scriptures and even as we are doing that we start we are we are beginning to get transformed into his image with ever increasing glory so right now on the earth itself this process of transformation has started already you know um, uh, christ is beginning to be formed inside believers and this process will get completed when we go over there to heaven because then we will literally see him with our eyes now we catch him i um, mean in the in the in the current age uh, we kind of catch glimpses of him through the scriptures 
while we are meditating on the scriptures. The Holy Spirit brings out new aspects of uh, God's glory. And we are um, impressed, awed by that, and we want to imitate him in those areas. So we start, we, we have already started being transformed into his image. But on that day, we will see him completely the way he is. And that will kind of spur us on to become completely like him. Uh, so just talking about how there is you no know, freedom in the spirit of the Lord right now. Uh, this is something that we all experience when we are having a quiet time. Um, just was it a few days ago, you know, when I was having my devotions and I was uh, studying from the book of Titus. And there was just this passage that I was uh, reading and God impressed something on my heart. And the Lord said, see, if it was me handling this particular situation that you're facing, this is the way I would do it. And so what was there in those verses kind of just jumped out of the page at me. And it's like the Lord was saying, if it was me, this is how I would do it. Now, what? how are you going to handle this? And I was like, OK, Lord, this is the attitude that you would have, is it? OK, then in that case, I too will try to imitate you. So you know, it's not something that I had really thought about till I read that particular passage uh, from Titus. And the Holy Spirit was speaking to me, revealing something about how God is, how the Lord Jesus is. And I thought, oh, OK, if Jesus would handle this in this way, maybe I too should do that. So in a very minute way, I have become a little more <laughs> like Jesus in that particular aspect. OK, so this is something that happens to us continually. There's freedom in the presence of the Lord. We start getting to know um, uh, more and more who he is. And we have the freedom to imitate him. You know, earlier we were slaves of sin. Even though we had longings, we had spiritual longings, we could never be those things. But now, with the empowering and equipping of the Holy Spirit, we actually have the freedom to imitate him and be like him, um, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in, in our Christian walk in the kind of attitudes we adopt, uh, in, the, in, in the way we um, you know, approach people, with the way we interact with them, the way we treat them, uh, in all of that. Now it's easier for us to do that because there's freedom in the presence of the Lord. His spirit enables us to uh, imitate him and be transformed into the image of Christ. Uh, so that day, when we actually go and stand in front of Christ, then it'll be, it'll be like you know, getting promoted to a entirely new level because right now i may be thinking uh, you know oh see i have become more loving uh, i'm following the scriptures i'm listening to god's voice and i'm imitating him more and more i'm really becoming uh, you know loving like him but that day when i go and stand in front of jesus and i literally see him with my eyes and he speaks to me then i will know what the fullness of love is like and I think, oh, wow, I never even knew that love actually meant this. And then I will want to be like that. I will imitate him in that. In the same way, when I'm standing there in front of him and literally looking at him and listening to him, then I think, my goodness, he is the king of kings and lord of lords. And look at his humility. And I will want to imitate that. I will want to be exactly like that. So, uh, uh, on that day, it say, you know, John says, when we see him, we shall be like him. Uh, but so this is our status. This is our future. These people who can speak hi-fi words and talk about secret knowledge and their encounters with the spirit, goodness knows what spirit they're interacting with. It's definitely not the Holy Spirit. But you know, they were boasting and talking about all these experiences that they were having. And they were making the true church feel inferior. And so John says to them, you know what? You are the children of God. And not just that, one day when you're going to stand in front of him and see him, you're going to be exactly like him. And then he makes another point as well. He says, what we will be has not yet been made known. One thing we know, that at least when it comes to our character, uh, we will be the way Jesus is, you know, in our humility, in our love, in our service, in our uh, justice and righteousness, in all of those things, we will become exactly like him. But then there is so much more. Everything that we are going to be that day is not yet revealed, 
but it's going to be something great, something big. So he's telling these believers there are greater things awaiting you all. So don't feel inferior. Don't feel that you know your uh, uh, simple gospel of the cross of Christ is something to be ashamed of. We don't need uh, high five philosophies. We have the cross, you know, uh, which contains the power of Christ, the gospel which is literally the power you know, are leading unto salvation. So there are higher things awaiting us. Um, and uh, regarding this, you know, maybe we can look at a couple of verses which will throw greater light on um, what we will be you know, in the future. And these are good scriptures to look at. Um, so the first scripture that we uh, could reflect upon is 1 Corinthians 13, 11 and 12. Uh, so, you know, uh, yeah, I think we had, um, was it Philip or uh, was it Collins? I'm not sure. One of you read out the previous one. If we could have someone, you know, uh, read out 1 Corinthians 13, 11 and 12, please. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 11 and 12. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Yeah, so again, the same, you know, a similar thought is being expressed over here. Um, he uses the example of a mirror. Now, when we think of a mirror, we think of our modern mirrors. I mean, I stand in front of a mirror, I can see every detail of my face. I can see every detail of what I'm wearing. The mirrors of the of that age of biblical times were not the mirrors of today. They didn't have this reflective, uh, uh, you know, coating which was painted to reflect back our, uh, you know, our reflection. In those days, mirror would just be very highly polished bronze. So if you were to stand in front of a wall made of polished bronze, how clearly would you see yourself? What you actually see, the reflection that you see is rather distorted in the, in the sense, you know, you'll either look probably look extra fat or extra thin because in the, uh, the bronze does not really reflect clearly. And plus, it's also blurred. Yes, you can kind of see an outline of yourself in that bronze shining surface, but it's in no way anywhere near the modern mirrors that we have today. So he says, now we see only a reflection as in a mirror and he's talking about those you know highly polished bronze mirrors which they used in those days but then uh, when we go to heaven he says we shall see face to face so now the things which i know about my future my eternal um, life in heaven in the, in the in the new heaven that is only in part but then he says then i shall know fully and he also talks about how here on this earth, everything that he's doing is actually childish. I mean, we may be thinking, you know, that we have grown in the Lord and, uh, you know, we have now we are now reaching the heights of spiritual growth and maturity and all of that. But he says what we are experiencing now is just uh, childish compared to what is awaiting us in the future. So he says, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But then, you know, in that future, I will become a man and I will sit, put away my childhood behind me and I will become all that I am meant to be in Christ. You know, so there are greater, bigger things awaiting us. And this same picture is conveyed in another interesting manner in Galatians chapter 4 verses 1 to 7. Um, I mean, I know we are kind of dwelling a lot upon just this one portion, uh, but these are the things which are awaiting you and me. You know, this is the future that we are looking forward to. Uh, so it is good for us to dwell on these things. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, it's today we have a lot of people reading out. It's excellent. Uh, if we could have someone read out for us Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. I mean, I know that's a lot of verses, but it really brings out, um, you know, some very interesting aspects of what is awaiting for us in the future. So Galatians 4, 1 to 7.
if someone could read out, please, Galatians chapter 4, uh, verses 1 to 7. Now I say that there, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so, we, when we were children, we were, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive as receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, being an heir of God through Christ. Yeah, uh, let's look at this uh, passage, you know, and compare it to what we saw earlier in 1 Corinthians 13. So over there, he's talking about how after coming to Christ, you know, he has set aside childish things and now he's becoming a man. Uh, but he also admits that whatever, you know, he understands of being a man is still a very dull reflection of what he's actually going to be later on. Because he says, now I know in part, then I shall know fully. So uh, um, that example is again kind of being repeated over here in Galatians chapter 4, where it first talks about the child. A child who is, you know, running around the house, playing and all of that. That little kid um, is over here, we are told, in no way different from the slave who is, you know, looking after the household. Uh, now, when the modern image we have of slaves or somebody who, you know, has been shackled in chains and being whipped and, you know, being made to work out in the plantations and all of that. But then in biblical times, Slaves were not really um, uh, anything, you know, low or inferior. Yes, you did have menial slaves who had to do physical labor, but then you also had highly qualified slaves, you know, who were, uh, I mean, the people at that time would spend a lot of money to purchase a highly talented and skilled slave because that man can then be trained up to look after the entire, uh, you know, administration of that entire household and the business which that household is running. And then uh, uh, because he's a slave, he would always stay with that household. So they, you know, they can be assured of his faithfulness towards uh, their particular family. Uh, so a lot of money was invested on purchasing such slaves and training them up. So this slave would basically, will basically be running the entire estate. And so this child who is the heir, who is running around the house playing, he actually tells the child, you know, be quiet, don't run around, you know, go back to your room. You see, he actually has authority over the child, even though the child is actually the heir. And then there is a time which, uh, which is set by the father, which it says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 2. When that time comes, then the father says, now my child is fully grown up. Now I am appointing him as the legal heir. I'm turning over all the affairs of the household to him. At that point, there's a radical change in the status of the slave and the status of the child. Up to now, it was the, it was the slave who was giving orders you know, and, and serving as a guardian and a trustee and looking after the child. But now the child has grown up. And now he has become master of the household. Now he is going to tell the slave what needs to be done. And the slave would be following his orders you know, from now on. And uh, um, Paul kind of draws upon that image. And he says, you know, when we were slaves of sin, it was the spiritual forces which controlled us. They told us what to do. We had no choice. But when the appointed time came, you know, it says in verse 4, when the set time had fully come, then God sent Jesus Christ so that we can become sons. Through Jesus Christ, we have now become sons. And because now we are sons, you know, we it literally comes out from the depths of our being. We cry out, Abba, Father, because we literally know him as Father. We no longer feel alienated from him. And because of that status which we have, 
where we are no longer slaves but God's child. You know, that's verse 7. So you are no longer a slave but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. So we are already beginning to put away the childish ways. We are growing into, you know, metaphorically into manhood as such. But that full status of heir, where we will assume the roles of authority and privilege and position which God has awaiting us, the details of that have not been revealed yet fully. So it's all being hinted at, you know, in Corinthians, in Galatians, in, in the epistle of John. It's being hinted at there is something greater awaiting us. But the details of it are not yet given. So what we are doing over here right now, you know, sometimes when we are going through life and things are really tough and we are doing the best that we can and we are serving God and we love him and we want to please him. But things are just not going the way we we had hope. And we wonder, what is what is this life all about? Where am I heading? You know, I'm doing my very best, but things don't seem to be going the way I want them to. I want to please the Lord. But even in ministry, things don't seem to be going the way I expected. You know, so we have all these questions and doubts. The thing is, we are in boot camp. We are being trained for something amazing which is awaiting us on the other side you know in the new heaven and the, and the new earth so this is all just us being taught to set away our childish ways and start getting ready for something that is awaiting us on the other side um you know, you know it, it's like the talent story which jesus talks about different believers have been given different talents so there are some who have been given more talents there have been some who have been given less talents God is not looking at the quantity of talents which he has given us. He's looking at the sincerity with what, uh, with which we are using what is already has what, uh, what has already been placed in our hands. So it doesn't matter whether you have been given 10 talents or just one talent. What are you doing with whatever has been put into your hands? Are you setting aside your childish ways and learning to walk uh, you know, uh, in the responsibilities that God has given you? Are you becoming a man? You know, in that sense. And if so, you know, you are getting prepared for what is awaiting us on the other side. So John is saying, you know, we are children of God. That is the love that God, the Father has lavished upon us. And not just that, there's more awaiting us. One day when we stand in front of Christ, we will be exactly like him. So on that day, we will be fully ready for what is awaiting us. And there is something that God has planned for us. He says, John says, the details of that are not yet revealed to us, but um, we will be fully prepared character-wise on that day for the role that we need to take on. So everything that we are going through, our response to every trial, our uh, you know, uh, uh, passion for the Lord in, in, in spite of the difficulties that we are going through, the commitment with which we are taking up even the small things that we are doing for the Lord. All of these things matter because all of the, these things show the Lord that we are willing to cooperate with him in setting aside childish ways and starting to become the heir that we are meant to be. Uh, so John is pointing his church towards that. He says, focus on that. Stop looking at what these Gnostics are saying. Stop dwelling on these secret revelations that they are claiming to have, all these spiritual dreams and visions and experiences that they are, that they are proudly boasting about. You may not be having those visions and experiences and all of that on a daily basis, but you are being prepared for something uh, you know, um, solid. These things which these people are boasting about, those will evaporate. You know, the, their empty words will evaporate one day. But what the church is being prepared for, it's being prepared for something solid that is actually awaiting them on the other side, you know, in the new heaven and the new earth. So don't focus on the criticism and the condemnation and the lies which are being spoken. But he says, focus on what you are being prepared for by the Father. Uh, so it's along these lines that he is talking. Therefore, he says in verse 3, 
all who have this hope of seeing Jesus one day and becoming exactly like him. Uh, he says, all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Because you see, an attitude of a person who is not really a follower of the Lord, his attitude is, ah, I've been made righteous by Christ, so my ticket to heaven is guaranteed. So, and plus when I go over there on that day and stand in front of Jesus, I'll in a way become like him. So while I'm here on this earth, let me enjoy sin. Would be the attitude of, per of a person who doesn't is not really a follower of Jesus. On the other hand, someone who really loves the Lord, they are going to be excited that one day they are going to be exactly like him. And so they start working towards that eagerly from now itself. Because you see, they know that what they are trying to achieve is not hopeless. It's actually going to be perfected one day. So, the, you know, it talks about Jesus being the initiator and the perfecter of our faith. So, uh, he who has initiated the process, we are excited about it and we want to cooperate with him. So we begin to purify ourselves even from now in anticipation of what you know, of the final thing which is awaiting us when we go and stand in front of him. We don't have the attitude of these fake Christians you know, who say, ah, my ticket is secure. Even my character is secure. One day when I'm, when I see, when I'm in front of Jesus, I'll become like him. So while I'm over here, let me enjoy my sin. No, I mean, that, that goes to show that that person never really became a follower of Christ at all. Because if you become a true follower of Christ, you're going to have the Holy Spirit in you. And the Holy Spirit will convict you. He will uh, urge you to change your ways. And so we would be a very different people. We would be on the move for the Lord. We would not be stagnating. Uh, so... Therefore, you know, he goes on to say in verse 4, he says, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. And so he says in verse 6, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. Um, I, these are all very important verses. Uh, so yeah, if we could have someone read out for us from verse 4 up to verse 8. Uh, no, up to verse 9. Yeah, 4 to 9. Of First John chapter three, verses four to nine, please. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he had been born. He has been born of God. Yeah. So what is this, the, is this passage saying? Here, John is declaring and he's saying, no one, who, whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed remains in him, in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. But the same John has told us earlier in chapter 1, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. So what, is he contradicting himself? No, not at all. It's just the translation which has not been brought out correctly. So in 1 John 1, you know, verse 8, when he says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. Yes, he meant it. Verse 10, when he says, if we claim we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar. Yes, he does mean that when he says that in 1 John chapter 1. Here, in this passage, it's the present continuous tense which is being used, you know, which NKGV does not quite bring out, but NIV and the other versions try to bring out this present continuous tense which is being used. So, you know, if you were to read that in, uh, in, uh, in the NIV, it says, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. In the same way, in verse 9, it says, no one who is born of God will continue to sin. 
uh, uh, and in the same way in the latter part of the verse, they cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. There's one translation which says um, they will not habitually sin. You know, so these are different translations which are trying to bring out that present continuous tense which is being used over here in this passage. Why? I mean, why will why will these believers not continue living like that? Because the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. He wanted to give us a new fresh start. So the people who come to him and place their faith in him, you know, he washes away their sins. He gives them a fresh new start where they can actually start living a, a victorious life over sin. So this is what God has awaiting for us. So someone who has genuinely come to the Lord will not go on sinning. And the main reason that they will not go on sinning, you know, like it emphasizes in verse 9, it's because God's seed remains in them. Um, now, if you were to, you know, uh, look at this metaphor, which is being used over here, you know, in a human sense. Um, so if a man is an, it's an excellent singer, you know, he has a, a, he has an amazing voice and he's an excellent singer. The chances are because his seed is there in his uh, son. His son also probably will have an excellent voice and will be able to sing very well. He's able to do that. He's able to be a singer because his father's seed is in him. You know, in, in a sense, uh, what, what would you say? The, the sperm of the father, the DNA of the father is there in the son. Over here, when it's talking, you know, metaphorically in a spiritual sense, what would it mean? having God, the believer having God's seed remaining in them. If you go, if you go to go back to the Gospel of John and you were to reflect on John chapter 3, where Jesus and Nicodemus are having that conversation over oh, there, what does Jesus say to Nicodemus? How are we believers born? We are born by the Spirit. So here, this God's seed which remains in us, it's basically the Holy Spirit you know, that is being talked about over here. So we who have been birthed by the Holy Spirit, we will not continue to sin because uh, we have been born of God. The Holy Spirit birthed us in God. So the old creation is gone. We were made into a new creation. So we will not continue to sin. Now, like it very clearly clarifies in First John chapter 1, you know, we will not be we, we will not be like those uh, fake Christians who are claiming that they are sinless and, and they're incapable of sin. We are not saying that. We are saying that we have been made righteous and therefore um, we have the freedom in the spirit to continue growing more and more into his likeness, to continue setting aside childish ways. So um, now this is the you know contrast between what the uh, false teachers were saying in, in John's day and what John himself is saying. The fake Christians were saying, we are now sinless. So even if we do anything which looks like a sin, you cannot label it as sin because we have received the secret knowledge which has made us superior beings. We, have, we are the chosen ones. So we are now incapable of sin, which is actually a lie. On the other hand, what does is, what is John say? You know, in First uh, John chapter two, verse two, we looked at how you know it says over there in First John two two, He Himself, that is Jesus Christ, became the propitiation for our sins. So in Him, all our sins have been washed away. We have been completely atoned, cleansed. So because of that, we are righteous. So we are not sinners. We are righteous, but like it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14, by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever. Okay, that's the first portion of the verse, Hebrews 10, 14, where through this propitiatory sacrifice which Jesus Christ did, he has cleansed us and made us perfect forever in the eyes of God. That has already been done. And he has done this for people, it says in the latter part of the same verse, Hebrews 10, 14. So these people who have been made perfect forever, you know, it is this, is, this has been done for those who are being made holy. They are being set apart. They are still in the process of being made holy. 
So there are two aspects to it. So positionally, in, this, in our inner person, we have already been made perfect. But when it comes to our unrenewed mind, when it comes to our attitudes, which are still undergoing a change, uh, we are still being made holy. Uh, you know, in NKJV, it says, for, for by one sacrifice, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So John is saying, understand what is being taught. You are not sinless. You have not arrived yet. Yes, in your inner spirit, you have the seed of God. You literally have the Holy Spirit who has birthed you into the family of God. So yes, you are righteous. But in your actions, you have, because you have understood the status which has, which has been given to you, now you are excited. So you start purifying yourself in anticipation of that day when you will stand in front of him and become exactly like him. You are excited about spiritual things. That is who you are. On the other hand, these fake Christians, these Gnostics, they don't have that passion for the Lord. They are not even trying to purify themselves. On the other hand, they are speaking lies and they are saying, oh, we are already perfect. We are incapable of sin and all of that. So John is teaching them the correct doctrine. And he's saying, you know, because you genuinely have been born of God, don't be like those people. Start purifying yourselves. Be excited about what is awaiting you in the future. OK, is what he is uh, saying to them. So uh, one aspect of being a child of God is obviously that you do what is right. You keep the commandments of the Lord. The other aspect is that you will live in love towards your brothers. That's the uh, 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 you know the next concept which he brings out in the um, uh, next few verses. So if we could have someone read out for us from chapter 3, uh, verses 10 to 12. Chapter 3, verses 10 to 12, please. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Exactly. So we, we have looked at the first aspect about how, you know, the true believers, the true children of God, they walk in righteousness. Um, and the other aspect is that they live in love towards their brothers and sisters. Um, so we who are the true believers, he, you know, John says, we should not be like Cain. Why did Cain murder his brother? You know, that, that's a statement which is made over here in verse 12. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Um, Cain was jealous of his brother's righteousness. Uh, he was jealous that God had commended Abel for his righteous actions. And he was upset that God you know, had rejected him because of his evil actions. Uh, so because of that, he chose to murder him. Um, you know, there are all kinds of theories about why um, Cain's uh, sacrifice was rejected, while uh, Abel's was accepted. So, you know, some the most popular theory is that um, um, Abel brought a lamb. So that would be a, um, a, a, a blood sacrifice. So it would be a sin offering. On the other hand, Cain uh, brought crops. So a crop would not be a sin offering. But then when you look at the Genesis passage, over there it does not say what kind of an offering was being given. I mean, what if it was just a Thanksgiving offering? For a Thanksgiving offering, you would just basically bring uh, from whatever your profession is. So if you are a farmer if and you want to give a thanks offering, you would basically bring crops. Um, on the other hand, if you are a shepherd, you would obviously bring uh, a lamb.
because you know that's from the background that you are coming uh, so people would you know bring their uh, bring in kind you know like in like, like during our modern harvest festival you know you bring products you know, I mean, in, in those days, they didn't really deal much in gold and silver. It was basically products which they would bring to the house of the Lord as their offerings. So, in fact, Leviticus 2 2 says that, you know, a grain offering is a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So, why was Cain's grain offering considered, uh, you know, uh, something bad? Why did Yahweh reject uh, Cain's? Um, you know, grain offering. Why did he not regard Cain's grain offering as a pleasing aroma, like it says in Leviticus 2 2? It is probably because Cain's actions were evil, his brother's actions were righteous. So God's focus was not on what was being brought, his focus was on the person bringing them. Cain did not bring his heart, he just brought his crops. Abel brought not just his lamb. But he brought his heart as well. He was one. He was one who chose to be righteous and honor God. That is the reason why you know God speaks so clearly to Cain with the words that the Lord uses. If you were to go to Genesis chapter four, verse six, then the Lord said to Cain, "Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted?" But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. The Lord is extending his hand to Cain and saying, there's still a chance. You know, don't be upset. Don't be angry. Rather than being angry and upset, why don't you repent? Because sin is crouching at the door. But if you rule over it and you choose to do what is right, will I not accept you? In the same way I accepted Cain, uh, Abel, I'll accept you as well. But Cain did not want to repent. He was overcome with anger and with jealousy towards his brother who is being commended. You see, he, he craved for the Lord's approval. Cain craved for the Lord's approval. He wanted to be approved, but he wanted to be approved on his own sinful terms. And you can't do that with a holy God. So the Lord said, you do what is right, I will accept you as well. I mean, you are just as precious, you know. So that is the problem with these fake believers in John's time. They are going after false doctrines. They are talking about, uh, you know, uh, secret revelations. They are not honoring the Lord. Um, uh, you know, they, they're going against the gospel which was taught to them. And John probably would have spoken to them. You know, other pastors and elders would have spoken to these people told them about the true doctrine, you know, told them, reminded them of, of what they had originally been taught. But these people, they chose not to stay in the church. They chose to leave the true church and go away. So like Cain, rather than repenting, they chose to just be angry and proud or whatever and walk away. So God extended a chance even to them, but they chose. So here, um, John is telling them, do not be like them. They have hatred in their heart. They have murder in their heart. So they are like Cain. On the other hand, you, the true believers, you will walk in love with one another because you are not like Cain. You are repentant. You are humble. You are open and submissive to the work of the Holy Spirit in you. You will accept correction. So he says, be like this. Don't be like Cain, who rejected repentance. He didn't want to repent. Um, so, you know, um, so uh, he goes on then to explain what kind of a love we should be exercising. Okay, so that we will look at when we come back from our break. Thank you.